this is a topic that I've been wanting to do actually for a long time, and I'm um, happy, it seems like a strange word, but happy to be talking about it um, because I work with a lot of patients with ADHD, and many of them struggle with suicidality. A lot of them have had attempts on their life. Um, and a lot of times they feel that the ADHD part is missed in the conversation when we talk about suicide. We typically will hear about depression and bipolar illness and substance abuse, all of which are very important disorders that we have to look at. Um, but ADHD is not really as highlighted in the suicide um, sort of literature. So before we get started, my intention of this presentation is really to just, one, just educate people about uh, what we know about suicide today and the epidemic that suicide is, um, also to where ADHD fits into that and how we have to assess our ADHD patients and understand that ADHD alone, um, of course, ADHD with depression and with other comorbid disorders, but even ADHD alone can present a risk factor for suicide. Um, I will have non-graphic pictures, but there'll be pictures of people, uh, some celebrities who uh, have been lost to suicide, as well as direct quotes from people. Um, I will have a discussion of some of the means that people use to take their lives, um, as well as will be some, there'll be some discussion about self-harm. And to keep in mind that the majority of people with ADHD do not take their own lives. Um, however, it's still a very important conversation to have. And I say that because sometimes, and especially if you're, a, this is your first time at the conference, if you're new to ADHD, if you're a parent of a child with ADHD, um, to not assume, oh my gosh, because my kid has ADHD, they're going to attempt suicide. Um, that's not necessarily the case. Um, many people can have thoughts of suicide and never make an attempt on their lives. So suicidality is something, as I'll talk about later, is important to explore and not be scared to have the conversation with our loved ones, with our patients, um, in, in understanding, too, that there are many people that struggle with suicidal thoughts that don't make an attempt on their lives. In the field of suicidology, we're moving away from the term committed suicide. Um, the word committed often denotes a sin. Um, and in, in literally, I mean, in certain um, uh, Catholic churches, certainly ones in the Boston area, they didn't even perform funerals for people who took their lives um, until recently that started to change. So we, we're using phrases like died by suicide, took their own lives. So why is this an important issue? Um, what's, suicide is truly become an epidemic. Um, here are headlines that show that our life expectancy has dropped from one year uh, to from the previous year to this year. And the two most common reasons are suicides and opioid um, overdoses. Uh, so suicide is, is rising and in all groups. Now we've heard of some celebrities, Anthony Bourdain, my favorite actor, Robin Williams, uh, Kate Spade, uh, that's Lee Thompson Young, who is a Disney, who's on a Disney show called The Famous Jet Jackson. Uh, Chester Bennington, who is a lead singer of Linkin Park, which I was, a, I am a huge, huge fan of, um, all uh, were in the headlines for taking their own lives. But the, for every celebrity, there are many, everyday individuals. These are nine NYPD police officers that this year alone took their own lives. And since I made this slide, unfortunately there was a 10th suicide in the NYPD uh, police force. So it's a problem in lots of different communities. So just to give you statistics, the best statistics we have were gathered the year 2017 in the US. There were 47,173 suicides. So that is 129 suicides per day, um, which means a suicide every 11 minutes in this country, which is, a, I mean, it's just shocking. For every actual suicide that happens, we have many suicide attempts, 1,400,000 suicide attempts every year. 40% of people um, who die by suicide had made a previous attempt. And that's about 14 people per 100,000 population is the national suicide rate. It's the 10th leading cause of death and the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 15 and 34. 
Um, in terms of gender, that males are more likely to take their own lives than uh, females are. Uh, they're four times more likely. Women are three times more likely to attempt suicide. Um, and as I'll talk about later, a lot of that has to do with the means by which men uh, tend to use to attempt uh, versus women. This is the age breakdown that we have right now. And let's you know pause for a moment and think five, the fact that we even have a statistic for five to 14 year olds is, you know, could give us all pause that um, it's about one child between the ages of five and 14 a day um, is taking their own lives. And as you can see that it, it's pretty uh, distributed through age groups. One of the um, increasing groups that we're seeing are men over the age of 60. In terms of marital status, that people who are divorced tend to have higher suicide rates, uh, and along with people who are widowed, uh, people who are single and married people um, have the, lower, the lowest suicide rate of marital status groups. There is definitely a higher rate in more rural communities than urban communities. Um, the top states that have uh, highest suicide rate per capita are states like Montana, Wyoming, um, the states in which you don't have a lot of people um, necessarily and people are often quite isolated. In terms of methods, that about 50% of suicides are by firearms. Um, so half of suicides uh, are by gun uh, death. And about 27% are through suffocation, which includes hanging. 13% uh, are through poisoning, and then other things would make up about 8%, things like jumping um, and uh, other means. So just a little about suicide and firearms. Um, so one of the uh, reasons that we see such a disparity in gender um, is that men who attempt suicide tend to use firearms and over 90% of firearm attempts result in fatality. Um, there are 60 gun suicides that happen uh, daily in this country. Um, in fact, 66% of gun deaths in this country are due to suicide. So two thirds of deaths related to guns are not homicide, but suicide. Uh, firearm suicides has increased 19% over the past decade in all ages and increased 61% amongst children and teens. And uh, it says here an 85% fatality rate. I've seen 90 to 95 as well. So anywhere from 85 to 95 fatality rate. Um, st states that find that higher rate of household uh, gun ownership, they're four times more likely to die by suicide. And that's after controlling for variables like poverty, unemployment, serious mental disorders, and substance abuse. And a meta-analysis, which is a statistical analysis where you gather a lot of different research studies and use these very advanced statistical models uh, to sort of rule out different variables, meta-analysis studies of 14 different well-done scientific studies found that the access to guns triples the risk of suicide. So there are a lot of myths about suicide because it's something that isn't always talked about and something that people have a very hard time talking about and hearing about. Um, the, probably the most important myth is that asking someone if they're suicidal will increase their risk of suicide. It's quite the opposite. That asking someone if they're have thoughts of killing themselves is not going to suddenly have them say, oh, I never thought of that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, they, if they have those, if they don't have those thoughts, they'll say, no, I don't have those thoughts. If they have those thoughts, there's actually relief that most people feel because the fact that you're even asking them is validating that people have these kinds of thoughts, that people are struggling enough that they are dealing with that. Because if we think about it, I mean, suicide, it's so against our human biology and our human evolution in so many ways. I mean, we really are not, you know, in some ways meant to do that. Um, so I think, and I've heard from patients of mine who struggle with this that say this just seems, you know, it's one thing to have these thoughts and then it's another thing of how you judge yourself for having these thoughts, thinking, well, I must really be like almost not human by virtue of the fact that I want to end my life. Um, so with the myth that suicide is often impulsive is not true, um, that most suicides are often mentally rehearsed, as I'll talk about later, um, where people unfortunately practice in certain ways. Um, the impulsivity 
maybe somebody who on that day, you know, might make a decision, but it's not that they, that particular day was the first time that they had a suicidal thought. Um, suicide, it, it pains me when, um, especially when a celebrity uh, is in the news and you get a lot of reaction from people to say how selfish, um, what a coward, um, suicide is not a selfish, cowardice act. Um, people who end their lives are doing it uh, for a multitude of reasons, but many of them actually think that they're bettering their loved ones' lives by leaving them. And we'll talk more about why that is later. A suicide attempt is just a cry for help. Now, a suicide attempt certainly is an indicator that a person needs help and that a person needs serious help. But this idea that it's just a cry for help um, sort of insinuates that someone is doing it for attention, which um, is a myth. Nobody does this uh, for attention. If someone really wants to die, they will find any means. That's actually not true, that a lot of studies show that even um, things like putting barriers in certain bridges um, can reduce the risk of suicide, not just from jumping off bridges, but from all other means. Um, contrary to popular belief, people don't necessarily um, attempt across means that a lot of individuals who use things like overdose will um, not often use other means of attempting. So if we can save someone's life by uh, harm reduction, by building barriers, that that can help. Um, I think a lot of times we can feel helpless and thinking, well, there's really nothing we could do. No, there's a lot we could do. Um, and there's a lot that's being done, but we need to do more. Uh, when people attempt suicide, they're 100% committed to it. Not really. Actually, through the lived experience of people who have attempted and have survived, many of them said that within seconds of doing whatever, um, whatever means that they did, they started to regret it. Um, and there's uh, a lot of experience in people who have lived through uh, suicide attempts in terms of how they think about what they were doing. Um, so there's, you know, this idea of being committed to something is a very, is a very strange uh, kind of word. Suicidal people don't make future plans. Um, we used to hear, well, if someone was giving away their belongings, if they weren't talking about the future, that was a big sign. It could be. But I've also worked with people who, you know, had plans to do big, great things and then to attempted suicide. Um, they had birthday parties planned. They might have had graduation in a week. They might have had um, many things that were in the pipeline. So this is what makes it so uncomfortable for all of us is that we don't really know at the end of the day unless we educate and we ask. Uh, people who die by suicide leave a note. Uh, most of them do not, which um, is, you know, can leave loved ones with a lot of questions, um, a lot of confusion. <clears throat> and not that a note is necessarily reassuring either. I mean, there's, uh, it just provides maybe some clue as to what was going on for that person. Uh, suicides are more common in lower socioeconomic levels. It cuts, ac it cuts across all socioeconomic levels. And only people with a psychological diagnosis and their lives, and that's not true. Although the majority of people who uh, take their lives will have a psychological diagnosis, um, there are some that do not. Um, so going into some special populations affected by suicide, um, certainly mental illness, that 90% of people who die by suicide will have a mental health condition. 15% uh, of people with major depressive illness will take their lives. 20% uh, of people with bipolar disorder, about half of people with bipolar disorder attempt suicide. So it's a, a very serious psychiatric condition. 10 to 15% of people with schizophrenia, 10% of people with borderline personality disorder. Um, I also specialize in the treatment of people with body dysmorphic disorder, uh, which is about a quarter of people with BDD attempt uh, suicide. <laughs> Uh, people with substance abuse problems are six times more likely to uh, die by suicide. And there are not very solid numbers, but I treat a lot of people with OCD. Um, that's very common in that population. And contrary to popular belief, the mortality rate of people with eating disorders is not through malnourishment, that there are just as many people with anorexia nervosa that take their lives as die by malnourishment. 
Um, and that's a very, very important um, statistic. A lot of times people assume that someone who's emaciated, that they're dying because medical, for medical reasons, but um, just half as many of those deaths of um, anorexia as well as bulimia through suicide. And then certainly PTSD and uh, people of trauma. Uh, military veterans are also another very important population. 20 veterans die every day by suicide. Um, they're one, veterans are one and a half times have a higher suicide rate than non-veterans. Very, very important population to pay attention to. As well as the LGBTQ plus community finds that they have three times the risk, and that's higher if they are representative of an ethnic minority group. Gay men are four times the risk of suicide, and trans individuals, about 33% of them, um, report a history of a suicide attempt, and 61% if they have a history of assault, which is very common in the trans population. Now, what we're going to be talking about is this population of neurodiversity. And um, there was a study by Kirby done recently that found that women who were on the autism spectrum had three times the risk of suicide than women who were not on the autism spectrum. And in addition, Fuller and Thompson did a study of women in Canada with learning disabilities like dyslexia and found that 16% of them had attempted suicide versus only 3% of non-learning disabled uh, women. And with men, it was 7%, 7.7% of the men with learning disabilities versus 2.1. And that was after controlling, again, for any comorbid disorders, socioeconomic status. So there was something very specific about that experience of having a learning disability. So which brings us to ADHD, which is uh, what this conference is about. So I'm going to go through some research um, and just talk about what we know empirically first, and then we'll talk about uh, why we are seeing this is uh, people with ADHD have this risk. So what's interesting about a lot of these studies is that a lot of them are quite international. So they go through different um, uh, countries of, of samples of individuals, which always enriches the empirical uh, data. So Chu in 2016 did a study of 11 and 18 year old uh, Taiwanese ADHD youth and found that 4.2% of them had a suicide attempt uh, for, and 8% had a suicidal ideation. And that was just looking and just assessing for um, the issue of suicidality. Um, Mays found that suicidal ideation was higher in the ADHD combined group versus the ADHD inattentive type, as well as suicide attempts were higher in the combined type, although not as much of a disparity with the attempts um, that we would see uh, as the suicidal ideation. Um, ODD, or Oppositional Defiant Disorder and Depression, proposes increased risk factors for suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Um, interestingly, anxiety disorder decreased the risk of a suicide attempt in this population uh, when it was just ADHD and anxiety. Now, part of that may be, as I talk about the theory that I'll be talking about with suicide, is that sometimes anxiety can be a protective factor from being anxious about the pain of of dying and, and harming oneself. Uh, Barkley and Fisher did a longitudinal study of 158 hyperactive and 81 control individuals over 13 years and found that while in high school, the ADHD hyperactive group were twice as likely to have suicidal ideation. And by what I mean by ideation in case um, is that they have very serious thoughts about ending their lives. Um, not these sort of transient thoughts, but pretty serious um, thoughts. Um, they were seven times more likely to attempt um, the people who had the suicidal ideation. Of all the people with suicidal ideation, the people with ADHD were seven times more likely to attempt if they considered. A conduct disorder was a major risk factor, and 81% of the people who attempted had a history of conduct disorder versus 37% of people who did not attempt. Uh, Swanson did a study, found that 22% of the ADHD sample uh, had a suicide attempt versus only 4% of controls. Now, Stephen Hinshaw did a great study in 2012 looking at a group of girls from the ages of uh, 6 to 12, and they were uh, represented a lot of different ethnic, a uh, lot of ethnic diversity, and did 10 year follow up and found that the girls who had the combined type of ADHD were more likely. Uh, to engage in self-harm and 
and or to make a suicide attempt versus uh, the girls with inattentive ADHD were less likely to make a suicide attempt. But they were also, um, there was still a high group of inattentive girls that had a history of self-harm. And so one of the uh, questions around that is like, you know, what, why would the combined type um, be? And, and one of the factors, particularly when it comes to women, is that women who um, represent as hyperactive are probably often have more social, um, are more socially ostracized and often have a lot of problems with peer groups. Um, and when we talk about the theory of, of uh, Thomas Joyner's theory, why that's really relevant. Um, Hertig looked at uh, Finnish ADHD in control adolescents and found, again, that um, ADHD groups were twice as likely to have suicidal ideation as well as self-harm. And they were more likely in this sample to be female, depressed, anxious, have substance abuse problems, and familial strain. Um, in more studies, Augusti in 2011 looked at a clinical sample of 365 adults with ADHD and 16% had made a suicide attempt. And having ADHD put your risk at about one and a half over people that did not have ADHD. Um, Barbarisi did a study of almost 6,000 ADHD adults and found the incidence of death from suicide was five times higher than not having ADHD. That's a large sample of people. So some of these studies are quite robust in terms of the number of people that they have in it. Uh, Cronus Toscano did a study in 2010, found that kids with ADHD, um, start, they started assessing them at between four and six years old, followed them over 14 years, and found that 12% of the kids with ADHD versus only 1.6% of the controls had a suicide plan by the age of 14. And then these are others. Um, the ones that I'll sort of point out are, uh, so Bauer in 2018, the second study down, uh, looked at specifically people with working memory deficits that found that people with working memory problems um, more highly predicted negative affect um, and that the relationship between ADHD and suicidal ideation was mediated by working memory deficits. So if somebody had ADHD and a working memory deficit, that increased their likelihood of suicidal ideation. Um, other meta-analysis studies find 2.91 times the risk of suicide attempts than controls, seven times more likely to make a suicide attempt in high school uh, versus control in the James study. Um, Manner, this was an interesting study. It was a small study, but 23 patients who presented in a psych um, emergency room for a suicide attempt, they were between the ages of 12 and 18, and they found that 65% of them had ADHD. Um, only 22% had been diagnosed previous uh, to the ER admission. But what's interesting is ADHD was the most common diagnosis. Uh, depression was the second most common. But I would guarantee you that in most ERs and in many clinical settings, you know, you would assess for depression and bipolar and substance abuse, and, and many of them don't assess for ADHD. Um, so we're missing a whole population in there. And part of that is, you know, ADHD is not a mental illness, but at the same time, we have to see it as a very important, um, you know, the fact that there's a neurodevelopmental condition here doesn't mean that there isn't impact into a person's self-esteem and ways that they see themselves. And a study in Australia found that over um, a study of 469 suicides of people under the age of 18, over an eight-year period, the most common diagnoses we saw were depression and ADHD. And then similarly, a sample of Japanese adults, um, anxiety disorders, they found that people with ADHD who also had anxiety, that that really amped up the rates of suicidal ideation. Now, what's also interesting is the role that ADHD plays as an additive suicide risk to other psychiatric disorders and illnesses. So as I talked about with they're just the general rates of depression and BDD and eating disorders, that what happens when you have that condition and ADHD. And sure enough, we find that there are quite, that ADHD makes a significant impact. Um, because of course, you know, sometimes people think, well, if the person's depressed, 
then we know lots of people with depression take their own lives. Um, how much is ADHD really adding to it? And it very much adds to it. So what are the theories of suicide in general? So we have all of this data, and there have been multiple theories um, over the years. I mean, starting with Freud, who talked about suicide as an act of self-aggression and anger and hostility. Um, Beck in 1974 talked about suicide as an expression of a sense of hopelessness. Um, and Baumeister talked about the idea of escaping pain. And Schneidman in 1993 talked about the idea of a psych ache, ache which is like heartache, but for the psyche. And all of those have um, certainly validity to them in terms of various elements of what we would see for people who take their lives. Um, but one of the, the most compelling theories is, uh, I would say one of the leading suicidologists today is a man by the name of Thomas Joyner. And he created a theory called the Interpersonal Psychological Theory of Suicidal Behavior. And basically, he um, it's combined a lot of empirical research that identifies three main factors that really um, increase the likelihood that someone will die by suicide. He called it thwarted belongingness, a perceived burdensomeness, and acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury. And basically with his model, he says, if you feel like you don't belong and you feel like that you're a burden, then that will increase your desire for suicide. What then crosses that bridge to somebody who actually makes an attempt or eventually may end their lives is someone who has acquired the capability, basically, to, uh, to, to, to die by suicide, to sort of en engage in acts and means of uh, killing themselves. Um, so thwarted belongingness. So a little bit about that. So why is this important to the ADHD community? Um, and these are quotes from patients of mine um, who say, I don't belong with anyone or anywhere. I don't fit in. I can't connect. And these are about their ADHD symptoms. This is not um, you know, primarily because of their experience with depression. In fact, they might have depression because they have ADHD. Um, don't assume if the person also is in a relationship, we don't assume that if that they feel like they still belong. Now we know that again, married people have, of all the different marital status groups, has the lowest uh, rates of suicide, but married people still end their lives, st still take their lives. So that feeling of not belonging could come from many different places. And many people certainly who struggle with depression have the experience of being in a room full of people and feeling completely alone. Um, we know that people with ADHD have lots of social and relationship problems and deficits. And this is a very, uh, one of those things that can really increase the likelihood of this thwarted belongingness. So in terms of treatment, and in terms of what we need to think about with this community is how people can feel like they more belong and they more fit in. Um, this is a patient of mine said, it's so easy to feel irrelevant when your ADHD makes it so hard to follow a conversation. You have no way of being part of something that you can't even keep up with. At some point, it becomes too hard to try and easier to just be by yourself. Uh, another patient of mine, a woman who says, I am constantly, I am told constantly that I am to this or to that, too loud, too much, too intense, too self-centered, too dramatic. After hearing that so many times, you start to think you're just too much for everyone. And this is someone who did make an attempt on her life and is doing very well right now. But um, she basically struggled with this sense of feeling like, I don't feel like I fit in. Um, and all of these had to do with these ADHD symptoms around connecting and social relationships. And all the executive functions that go along with having social skills. I care very much about relationships, but my ADHD makes it hard to show that. My wife tells me that if I cared enough, I'd be on time. If I truly loved her, I wouldn't make the same mistake over and over. I start to believe maybe I'm not cut out for relationships. And so many of us, and I have ADHD, have heard um, you know, through multiple messaging channels of you know, if you cared about this, you'd be on time. If you cared about your work, you would have looked it over. If, you know, there's a lot of negative messaging um, in that. 
And sometimes it's, it's unintentional. I mean, people are not meaning to make people necessarily feel bad, but we do have to be aware that words matter. And for people with ADHD who, um, you know, as Dr. Rothstein's talk last night had talked about emotional dysregulation, you know, we're individuals that are very emotional individuals. And so we can absorb things and take things in also in a, a much deeper way. Uh, people with ADHD have higher rates of peer victimization or bullying, uh, which can certainly lead to a feeling that you don't belong, um, can often have poor family relationships. Now, it doesn't mean, again, that this is true for everyone with ADHD. There are lots of people with ADHD who have wonderful families. Um, however, there's a lot of people with ADHD, probably unmanaged or untreated, who might have parents who have unmanaged, untreated ADHD, which can cause a lot of dysfunction um, in a family. Um, this is what one of my 14-year-old patients said, when your own family doesn't like you, respect you, pushes you away, then who is going to be there for me? And this is a kid that, I mean, his father actually said in front of him, I, I love my son, but I don't, I don't like him. I really, I don't want to be around him. He is miserable. I never signed up for this. Um, and, you know, dad, and trust me, I mean, the kid is can be quite challenging. I mean, it's certainly, there's been a lot that this family has gone through, um, but what dad didn't, and certainly dad didn't know that how the son was absorbing this was maybe I should just not be here. Um, and he had, he didn't have an attempt, but had serious suicidal ideation. He actually would practice writing suicide notes, um, although he never attempted, but what we he, eventually admitted that he had written like eight or nine different suicide notes like over months just to practice what it would feel like even being in that headspace. So we know 50 to 60% of people with ADHD have learning disabilities and that having a learning disability with ADHD can be very, very difficult experience. I have a son with ADHD and dyslexia. Um, have, this is from a patient of mine who is in his early 70s and he said, um, having dyslexia in the 1950s was synonymous with just being dumb, a dunce. No one saw it the way they do now. The message was clear that you just weren't like anyone else, and that was a bad thing. A teacher told my mother that I shouldn't bother going to high school. And I've heard many of those stories, particularly from older people who have um, learning disabilities, dyslexia, that... It wasn't unheard of for teachers to just say he should just be an apprentice, she should be an apprentice, or she should just have babies, um, you know, back in the day. Um, I always felt different than others and not in a good way. I never wanted people to really know me because then they would know how stupid I am. Even though I always had friends, I always felt like a fraud, like I was the best con man. Now, this is an individual I work with who made a very serious suicide attempt. He jumped in front of a train. Um, he survived miraculously. Um, but he was the kid that everyone would think, how, how could this happen? He was very popular in his school. He had an admission to a top university. He was a senior in high school. He had a girlfriend. Um, and... Little did you know, people know that he was experiencing all of these issues. He felt this entire time that he was the world's best con man. Um, he said, I think I just fool people because people don't really know. He has dyslexia, very severe dyslexia and ADHD. But despite having both dyslexia and ADHD, is a top student in his class. But he says, it's not because I'm smart, I just work super hard, and he does work super hard. But how he hears, how he internalized that is, like, I'm working like so hard, and at some point I'm not gonna be able to do this. And so once he actually got admitted to the college that he got, that's when the thoughts just came pretty seriously in his mind, because he thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna be four more years of this and fooling more people. I know it may be over the top, but I can't help feeling what I feel. If someone doesn't like me or rejects me, it is physically painful, like someone stabbing me in the stomach. I can't bear it. So we know also that having comorbid disorders like depression can also increase the likelihood of this feeling of thwarted belongingness. Um, Barclay and Fisher found that people uh, with ADHD and suicidal ideation were more likely to have major depressive uh, illness. So we know that certainly when those comorbidities are also in the mix, um, it could be a pretty serious impact. And also there's an exponential social burden of ADHD and accumulative damage that, you know, ADHD, 
you know, it's, it's a moving, breathing thing because it's kind of in us in a way and understanding that someone could not have some of these issues with ADHD when they're eight or nine, let's say, in terms of belonging and social, but then they hit puberty and the rules change a little bit and they can't adjust to those rules or they don't understand those rules. And then we see those problems, or maybe they do great. I've worked with people who do wonderful in school. They have their friend group, but then once they go to college, they don't know how to make, you know, it was easy when your friends all lived in your neighborhood. It's a very different thing to make new friends. So perceived burdensomeness, the other factor that Thomas Joyner talks about, is basically what we mean by that is a feeling of ineffectiveness that someone feels in both themselves and their, percep their perception that that ineffectiveness will affect others or society in a stable, permanent way. So it's not only I am ineffective and I am a burden, but it is that I am now not only not doing anything and a burden, but I'm now making it hard for either people or the culture as a whole. And so it's very easy to see, again, why people can get into the space of thinking that they're relieving a loved one of this burden that they feel themselves to be. And truth be told that we, you know, there are lots of people with adult ADHD who might struggle with unemployment, who might be adult children living in their parents' houses, who might be a burden, but their parents don't, you know, being a burden and, you know, understanding that the ADHD is really the thing that's burdensomeness, that is, that is where the burdensomeness comes from and this person needs help. Um, certainly the impact of executive functioning issues is huge. So when we try to tackle this particular variable of, of perceived burdensomeness with my patients, I'm always looking at the executive functioning issues. Um, the better the executive functioning issues, the less likely they're going to feel the sense of burdensomeness around their ADHD. Um, but certainly when you have serious executive functioning problems, it can make you feel demoralized, ineffective, um, incompetent. And again, some of these individuals I work with are quite competent in their executive functions, but in their minds, they feel like they're still burdening, burdening other people. What is the point of living when I am nothing but a drain on everyone because I cannot do an effing thing independently? I am a drain on society. Killing myself would eliminate a genetic mistake. This is from an 18-year-old uh, boy. Killing myself would eliminate a genetic mistake from the human gene pool. Failure after failure, what else am I supposed to think? Um, so these, these are thoughts that, I mean, when we shared this with his parents, his parents were shocked that he felt this way. I mean, they knew that school has been difficult, that there were a lot of struggles, but the fact that they felt that is, I mean, it's painful to sit with. I mean, someone feeling like they're a mistake to the human gene pool, it's a very, very um, striking quote. Um, parental child conflict, which is going to happen in any family, um, but particularly for families where ADHD is present, we would see an increase of that. Now, Again, I want to keep in mind, parent-child conflict does not cause suicide, but we know that how that conflict is dealt with, how it's processed, how it's done, is it done well? I mean, there are good ways to have conflict and very unhealthy ways to have conflict. Uh, when it's not healthy, when it's not resolved, when there isn't a debriefing where people are not understanding what needs are being um, asked for, um, it can cause a lot of strife and leave somebody feeling bur burdened, that they're a burden. Uh, my parents and I fight all the time and then they fight about me. So I'm against them and they are against each other because of me. All because I can't get my act together in school. I suck at school, suck as a son, suck at life. Um, this is a 13 year old. Um, and this was a boy actually who um, admitted and reported in our session that he was looking on uh, pro-suicide websites, which there are websites out there that teach you how to end your life. Um, and he started exploring those sites. And this is the beginning of what I'll talk about in the next variable is very, very dangerous behavior because it's, the, it's almost like a grooming process that makes people more and more comfortable with the idea of doing that.
Uh, financial problems, occupational issues, and unemployment can certainly produce a feeling of burdensomeness on uh, individuals. I can't support myself right now, even though I know most 25-year-olds can. It's all, it's like all that was taught one day in school and I wasn't there because I overslept. I'm afraid my parents and then my older brother will have to take care of me my whole life when they should be enjoying their own lives. So with this individual, you know, a lot of it was he would get very, very stuck on the idea that he's not where he felt he should be. And unfortunately, that was making it difficult for him to avail himself to the treatment. The, we were doing primarily a cognitive behavioral treatment, some coaching. He couldn't even connect to it because he was so unaccepting, basically, and not he had no compassion for himself that this is just where he was at 25. He might get to where he needs to be maybe a little bit later. And we see that a lot with people with ADHD. So educating people about, it might take a little bit longer for you to get where you need to get. And yes, you might need to do these things that you have to do that are different than other people do it. You might need a little more support, but if that gets you to where you need to go and, and be independent, then it's all going to be worth it. Um, he had a very, very hard time accepting that. So the last variable that Joyner talks about is the acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury. So what he found, in, in, and I'll mention his books at the end, is that most people um, have a fear of death um, in terms of really com doing a danger or harm to themselves. And at the same time, when that feeling and the feelings come over people who end up making attempts on their lives, that something is overridden for those individuals that make that connect from that ideation that turn into an attempt. And what Joyner says, it's really an habituation to painful and pro what he calls provocative events. And this includes even injuries. So we're not just talking about people who cut themselves, let's say, who have self-harm behaviors. That absolutely, I mean, there are lots of people that self-harm that never attempt suicide and that never have the intention of dying by suicide. However, lots of people who die by suicide may self-harm for a period of time beforehand. And what that self-harm is doing is getting them habituated to pain. It's making them less scared of it. It's making them less scared of seeing the blood, of seeing things that would normally sort of be like, oh, you know, to anyone. Um, and when you have ADHD, we know our ADHD brains are, you know, we have deficits in dopamine. So we need a lot to begin with to even get some level of stimulation. And for a lot of people with ADHD, even some of the ways that they might self-harm don't sort of send off those danger signals. So you can lose your danger signals for fear and pain by engaging in acts like getting tattoos. And again, I just always want to preface, there's nothing wrong with getting a tattoo. I have tattoos. I think they're cool. Um, however, I have to tell you the second time, the second one I got, I actually fell asleep on the bed. I was snoring while the guy is like tattooing. And I said, oh, was I snoring? And I mean, they have Enya playing, you know, like, that's, and he was like, yeah, I've never had someone fall asleep while giving them a tattoo. But that tells you something about my biology, that I was able to fall asleep, well, something that could be very painful. Now, I actually have a pretty low pain tolerance, but for other things, I have a high, it's inconsistent. Um, so if you have people, a group of people who tend to engage in acts that are higher stimulation seeking, maybe even like death defying, you know, like skydiving and things like that, they're, they're almost becoming habituated to, to that. And it doesn't mean that people shouldn't do those things, but being aware, I'm aware as a clinician that if I'm working with someone who has ADHD, who has suicidal ideation and has done a lot of those things, it makes me more worried and concerned. But it doesn't even have to be the physical act. Um, many of my patients mentally ruminate and rehearse how they're gonna kill themselves. They've thought about it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to the point where it actually can be a soothing thought to them. I have many patients say, you know what? Even if they haven't attempted, they say just the idea, I have it so rehearsed in my mind that it literally just makes me feel so calm that I could just exit at any moment if I needed to. I don't have to deal with all of this overwhelm. Um, and then the ones, that, the patients that I work with who do attempt uh, suicide, many of them say that they had rehearsed it 
hundreds if not thousands of times um, before um, they did it. We find that groups that have exposure to violence and pain have higher suicide risk. Uh, police um, police force, physicians have one of the highest suicide rates in the country. Um, I was at the American Association of Suicidology Conference in April and they had a documentary and a panel of physicians and talking about everything from how we train physicians, the grueling hours of residency and, and what we expect them to do and basically ignore signs of sleep deprivation and hunger and all of those things. That that can have a really serious impact on, again, someone who's disconnected from their own body signals to tell them, like, this is not good, like, this is pain. Suicidal children are, have higher pain tolerance, fewer displays of pain and crying and injury, and a higher likelihood of being abused. Um, as I mentioned before, the ADHD brain craves dopamine. Kids with ADHD have higher rates of injury than kids without ADHD. And the risk of self-harm um, is much higher for people with ADHD. And if you self-harm, you have a hundred times greater risk of dying by suicide. So it, it's, you know, it, again, many people who self-harm don't attempt. However, we shouldn't assume that it's, um, that they're never, you know, going to attempt. There's a serious risk factor there when someone self-harms. Um, and then Lamb found a significant association for self-inflicted injuries in ADHD. And kids with ADHD between the ages of 5 and 15 had four times risk of hospitalization for suicide attempts and self-harm. Uh, kids with ADHD have higher risks of physical and sexual abuse and trauma. Um, sleep problems, that people with ADHD have chronic sleep um, issues, which again can sort of get the body used to being in pain, feelings of pain or discomfort. Uh, substance abuse rates are higher. Uh, Stephen Henshaw, who had done a lot of research on girls with ADHD, finds a higher risk of eating disorders. So this is a, a quote from one of my patients. It might look like my attempt was impulsive, but the truth is I rehearsed it hundreds and hundreds of times to the point that it became more normal than what life felt like. In fact, it was, sooth it was a soothing distraction. Harming my body was nothing new to me. This was a patient who was severely bulimic and a former drug user. The fear of killing myself I felt the first time I thought of suicide at 14 melted away over the years with practice, like an athlete building enough muscle through training that they become fearless. So basically, as far as a suicide assessment, we don't want to be alarmed when someone tells us that they're having these thoughts, and we don't want to be dismissive. We want to definitely hear them out, not interrupt them, listen to what you know they're saying, ask lots of questions after they initially sort of report. Um, certainly when I have a patient that has attempted multiple times, uh, that this is someone who's in a higher risk factor uh, group. Do they have access to means? Um, I ask patients who are suicidal if they own a gun, um, and if they, you know, if there are people that live near bridges, the Golden Gate Bridge. There's someone who jumps off that bridge once a week. Um, there are certain bridges that are just historical, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, suicide. In Boston, we have the Tobin Bridge that is a common jumping point. So if I have a patient that lives near there, near the Tobin Bridge, that uh, alone could be something that I sort of keep in my head. Um, how much do they feel that sense of burdensomeness? How much experience have they had? And what are their connections and their relationships? Do they feel really connected in their relationships? And also, I often try to distinguish, do they wish they were dead. And I have some patients that say they just, they don't necessarily wish they were dead. They just wouldn't, they wouldn't mind if they didn't wake up. And I hear this a lot from ADHD patients who are like, I don't know if I want to die or it's just, I don't know how to live in, you know, in this world. Like, I just don't know how to do it. Um, and that's where executive functioning and all the work that we all do with ADHD becomes that much more important because a lot of these patients, a lot of these individuals don't want to die. They, they're they just looking for a manual on how to live a, a content life. Um, what are their, do they have a plan, methods, how specific? And I definitely look at how the sense of fearlessness they have around it and what kind of preparations or plans they made. So in terms of treatment implications, we need to treat ADHD. 
And we need to understand how ADHD impacts those comorbid disorders. This is something I do a lot of work in and a lot of training and in trying to let hospitals know, trying to, you know, let other clinical uh, venues understand that ADHD is not just an academic issue. And I've heard from psychiatrists and from physicians, oh, well, that person has ADHD, but they're not in school anymore. And they sort of dismiss it, um, which is, you know, we, we need to do more in recognizing that. And I always assume the ADHD impacts the treatment of those disorders. When you have ADHD, it undermines the treatment of ADHD. It undermines the treatment of depression. It undermines the treatment of an eating disorder. So if you're not looking at the ADHD, you're missing a very, very important component. Um, in terms of suicidal interventions and crisis intervention, we really focus on a sense of belongingness and that perceived burdensomeness. A lot of times there's so much that a patient might have in their minds and I say, okay, what are like the one or two things that are really getting in your way right now that are literally making you not want to live? And maybe two things. And that's what we focus on. Let's make some concrete recommendations and work on those maybe one or two things first. And sometimes that's all it needs is to just get some of that, you know, for them to have some sort of plan, uh, a healthy plan of living. Because sometimes people will be like, and this is happening and this and this and this and this, and there are 20 things. We're not gonna tackle all 20 things. However, there might be a theme to a lot of those things. Um, there's in, in clinical settings, there's this notion of what's called a no suicide contract, which is like, I mean, basically you have a patient sign something like, I will not kill myself or harm myself by the next meeting. Those don't work at all. Um, and we never want to tell a patient what not to do. We want to focus on what can you do? We don't need to tell people what they, people with ADHD, we're, we're very used to being told what not to do. Um, if you have firearms, is there proper storage, secure lock, separate ammo? Um, there was a study by Brent that found that um, almost a third of families that have a depressed teens who were actually advised by the clinician to remove guns from their home because of serious suicide risk, only a third of them removed the firearms. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of issue and it can get sometimes political um, with this, but this isn't a political issue. It comes down to the science. And we know that 50% of suicides are by firearms. And if you have access, it, it increases your risk dramatically. It's that simple. Um, in the ER, we need to screen more for ADHD um, as a diagnosis. And then as far as treatment, um, dialectical behavior therapy, which was initially uh, designed for people with borderline personality disorders and people who have a lot of self-harm behaviors, um, it's now been used in all different disorders and conditions and could be very useful for ADHD. Um, it includes basically four modules of mindfulness, how to tolerate distress, how to regulate emotion, and how to have effective interpersonal skills. And DBT is a wonderful model. It's very skills-based. It's very concrete. Um, I feel it works very well for ADHD patients who are very dysregulated in these areas. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy also very um, can be very, very useful. Many patients who struggle with these issues have a lot of what we call cognitive distortions. So this isn't psychosis. It's We all have cognitive distortions. It's just ways that we think that might not always be 100% accurate, but when we think of those things a lot and they're more intense, it can really get in the way. Um, and you know, you'll see it in things like depression. So all or nothing thinking or something called mind reading where, oh, I'm gonna walk in a room and I assume everyone, you know, doesn't want me to be there. And you really sort of help a client actually assess, is this accurate? Now, sometimes it might be accurate. And I say that because CBT is not about changing every negative thought to a positive thought. It's, we wanna be accurate. So I do have some patients that are very socially off-putting. And then psychotherapy and, really addressing shame and stigma. I mean, ADHD, the, the good news is that with younger people, I see a lot less shame and stigma. Um, every kid that I work with with ADHD has a friend that has ADHD. Um, it doesn't mean it's easy for them to have ADHD, but the idea of, or the stigma around the diagnosis, I'm seeing it less with younger people. Older people, not so much. I mean, there's a lot of stigma and shame um, still around it. 
But certainly there's a lot of shame around suicidal thoughts. And a lot of times people don't share their thoughts of, of suicide because they're fearful of what people will think of them, that they're freaks. It'll just almost confirm everything that they feel about themselves. So we need to create a space for people to say, I have thoughts of killing myself sometimes. I had, you know, I, I had a, a daydream that I jumped off a bridge and it actually made me feel good. That can be very disturbing to hear, but if somebody has that thought, I wanna hear about it. If, you know, one of my patients, if one of my children ever had that thought, I definitely wanna know um, about it so we can address it. And culturally, we need to destigmatize suicide, certainly in religious settings, we need to support survivors of suicide loss. Um, and have an, a lot of media responsibility. And at the suicide conference I went to in April, there was, they're doing a lot of great work. Um, American Association of Suicidology, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in consulting with how suicide is even talked about in media, because there are um, studies that shown that if it's talked about in a certain way, it could actually increase um, suicides in that area. Um, so it has to be done very responsibly. And then uh, briefly in terms of pharmacological treatment, they found there were no differences. Uh, Chu found no differences in suicidal ideation or attempts, whether someone was taking meds or not. Um, a meta-analysis of 15 studies found no difference in risk, whether they were taking medications or not. So we know that, and then there are other studies that find that when somebody is treated for their ADHD through medication, that it could uh, lower their risk. Um, however, we can't assume that medication, it doesn't fix the hole in the soul, you know, that medication absolutely can help things, but if somebody has still that sense of not belonging, that sense of feeling like a burden, and if they've had some acquired ability to enact lethal self-injury, that, that it, it, the medication isn't going to be as protective of a, risk, of a factor as we think it will. And these are books I highly recommend. So Tom Joyner, who the model I presented, his book, Why People Die by Suicide, I think is the best book. It's very um, user-friendly in terms of reading. You don't have to be a research scientist uh, to read it. It's very well written. Um, his father, uh, Thomas Joyner's father, died by suicide. So he has a personal connection uh, with this topic, but he is the nation's leading suicidology uh, research. He wrote another book called Myths About Suicide, which is fantastic. Uh, Kay Redfield Jameson, who is a psychologist who wrote a fantastic book called Unquiet Mind um, about her own struggle with bipolar disorder. And this is her other book called Night Falls Fast. She's a fantastic writer as well. All of her, all of her books are great. Uh, for people who um, are survivors of someone that they lost due to suicide. These are wonderful books. Grieving a Suicide by Albert Sue, Life After Suicide by Jennifer Ashton, who is a medical correspondent on, I think, Good Morning America. She was at the conference. Her ex-husband had taken his life um, and No Time to Say, Say Goodbye by Carla Fine. Question is, um, with suicide, asking someone if they have thoughts of suicide doesn't make them want to die by suicide, but we also have to be careful with language that's used. And the question asks is what's something a parent could maybe approach um, in talking to their child about it. You can just say, you know, I, I notice that you've been really down or I notice, you know, school's hard for you or, you know, what, what is it that you're observing in their behavior as first kind of laying the groundwork as to why you might even be asking them the next question, which is, have you ever had thoughts of hurting yourself or have you ever had, you know, thoughts of not being here? And it can be as direct and as blunt as that. The, with media reporting, what studies find that actually can increase suicide is when um, there's a lot of detail in how a person killed themselves um, and the response that somebody gets sometimes. Um, and a lot of media doesn't do it well. Like we don't need to know the details of how Robin Williams took his own life to know that he took his own life and we lost a very amazing you know, talent. Um, but once that information is out there, it we find that that can sort of provide people who already have those thoughts sort of more access. And sometimes, especially if it's someone that they revere or someone that they really look up to, um, can sort of almost mimic. But as a parent, 
you can say, you know, you lay down what, what you're observing that makes you even ask that question and then say, have you ever had those thoughts? And now you might, your teen or your kid might be like, no, like, why would you ask that? And that's okay. You know, let them be offended. Um, and you, and you can say, because I know, and this helps also let them know that if they ever do have these thoughts, that you're not going to be so scared and disturbed by them. I mean, you'll be scared, but you won't be scared that you like in a way that's telling them, please, I wish I didn't, you know, hear that. Um, you you would say, because unfortunately, lots of people do. And I've, I mean, my son's in high school, he's in, he's 14 and, you know, he's the son of a psychologist. So he's been hearing this for years, but i have you know, I say, you are going to know people that are going to struggle with depression and with a substance, you know, um, and, um, you know, there are going to be these issues that sort of come up. Um, and, you know, you let me know if there are anything that you're feeling and that there's nothing that's going to like, you know, scare me away in a way that I'm not going to want to keep an open dialogue. Fortunately, part of this is how parents do feel about it. And sometimes parents are like, I want to have this conversation with my child, which I can, I can respect that. However, as you had mentioned, we also live in a world of social media. These kids, I mean, I, you know how many patients of mine who will be like, I just got a text from my friend who says that she wants to kill herself. I just saw a Facebook post. I just saw an Instagram. Like they're getting like, it's not even people face to face. It could be sometimes people they don't even know um, and they're getting this. And there are ways absolutely in a middle school, it doesn't even, you don't have to be graphic. You don't have to be like, do, do you giving the, some of the details that I shared with you today, but what is it like, where do you go when you're feeling bad? You know, who, who do you go to? Uh, who do you identify as someone to talk to? Is there anything you wouldn't tell anybody? Just even like basic language like that, um, we can start with. Now in, in my town, I live in uh, Reading, Massachusetts, and we have this thing called Challenge Day, which is a, a, around the nation, I think. And it's these facilitators that come in. It's a whole day with the uh, eighth graders. And, and they really dig deep in having these kids sort of explore. But one of the facilitators talked about how she had made a suicide attempt, how she had been sexually assaulted, um, and puts it out there. And these kids really then, it just sets it's a model for them to talk about their experiences. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Now, some parents opt their kids out of that, and I can respect that. Um, but at the same time, it's out there. Like you can't, you can't get away from it. And I, and I, I understand because you know none of us as parents want our kids to even recognize the harshness of the world. But it's, it's there whether we like it or not. This is a teacher, your teacher, a middle school teacher who has seen, um, you know, what used to be seen in the high school population now in middle school populations around suicidality. And unfortunately, we're seeing that uh, very much. Interestingly, many years ago, um, and I was doing a study of body image and eating disorder um, attitudes in boys, and it was a high school uh, boys. And part of the study was me doing, giving them all these questionnaires and surveys. I was going to measure their height, weight, and body fat. And body fat means like they take off their shirt and I have to squeeze their body fat with skin calipers. Now I have an assistant with me, so I wouldn't be alone with these boys. So I'm going to these different high schools, telling them like, this is a study. And I'm totally expecting them to say, I don't know, like you're asking them to take their shirt off. Nope, they didn't have a problem with that. What they had a problem with was me asking them if they ever had thoughts of suicide. And I was like, what? Like it totally shocked me. I said, you don't mind that I'm asking them to take their shirts off and I'm going to be like squeezing their body fat, you know, on their, and they're like, and then of course their parents have to sign off on that. They said, no, but we were uncomfortable with you asking them if they have thoughts of suicide or made an attempt. I said, why? Now this is, mind you, like I said, if they do, you understand, I would follow up like this. I, I would, I wouldn't just be like, okay, bye. And you're out the door. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> see ya. Um, I would, I, I have services. I have like, it, this would basically be, I'd be offering these free resources to them. And they were like, no, that's really uncomfortable. There was only two schools of like 20, 20. They had a problem with that and me asking them if they, um, have a history of being abused. And I said the same thing. I said, but if a child is, is reporting to me that they're being abused, don't, shouldn't we want to know that? Like, is, I mean, I could do something with that.
it's a great point. So um, the comment was that a lot of times with suicide prevention, people assume we're talking about it like stage four cancer. Um, like, uh-oh, this is when we, it doesn't have to be that way. It could really be around just, again, these basic dialogues of where, how do you see your worth in the world? And especially when you have someone with ADHD and a learning disability, you know, where do you find, I mean, some of the, like Michael Phelps, I remember, you know, said that the best thing his mom did was just get him into swimming, 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 swimming. So she take, pull him out of school to have him swim. And, you know, sometimes you make those kind of decisions because that's where his sense of worth is. And even though he had a teacher that told his mom, who was a teacher, that he probably wasn't, you know, going to basically amount to anything and, you know, look where he is. So we can't have these initial discussions of where do you, what is, what does that even mean to you to belong? You know, where do you belong? Where do you fit in? You know, do you feel, I mean, even in the way we know about like social hierarchy and how to begin to have conversations about that um, in that way. The truth is, in this challenge day that that my um, my son's school did, they have this thing called the, um, you cross the line. So everyone's like literally along a line, and then it says cross the line if you've have, if you have a family member that has a substance abuse problem, and people do. I mean, they don't hold back. And one of them was if somebody has in your family has um, attempted or taken their own lives. And there were a number of people that crossed, kids that crossed the line. So there, it's, in, it's in there, but the secret, there's such a shame and a secret. Um, um, so I thank you all for being in this space with me and, um, and just take this information with you. Thank you.